And I want people like that to be scared. I want them to be afraid that someone like me will come along and catch them. And I will use their words against them. And I wish my channel were larger so that Jennifer Soto and Steven Stearns would have been too scared to do this because they knew someone like me or one of the members or subscribers of my channel or four members who have a bunch of great comments about this case would be onto them, would post their case in the forum and we would expose them. It, unfortunately, it's too late for Madeline Soto. What does Jennifer Soto know about the murder of her daughter, Madeline Soto? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. In today's video, we'll analyze an interview Jennifer Soto did with WFTV shortly after she reported her daughter missing to determine if she had guilty knowledge. If you're not familiar with this case, here's a quick Summary, Madeline was reported missing on February 26, 2024 by her mother and her mother's boyfriend, Stephen Stearns. A few days later, detectives found photos of Stephen driving what appeared to be Madeline's dead body in order to dump, dump it off in a dumpster. Police recovered her body, arrested Stearns for her murder but have not arrested her mother, as far as I'm aware. So what we're going to look for in this interview with Jennifer Soto is whether or not she was involved in the murder, if she had guilty knowledge, if she was lying about what she knew and didn't know in this interview. The other thing we're going to do while we're listening to this interview is run it through two of my checklists, which you can find on my new forum, DD Forum forum.deceptiondeck.com. The first one is my missing child presser interview checklist. So when a parent like Jennifer Soto here gets an opportunity to speak to the media about their missing child, we can expect them to do certain things if they actually do not know what happened to their kid. For example, they will speak about their kid in the present tense. They will be cooperative. They will try to answer the questions. They will be inconclusive about what happened to their kid, because if they don't know what happened, there's no way for them to be conclusive about it. We can also expect them to address any potential kidnappers. So even if they're not sure the kid was kidnapped, they might still speak to the kid, any potential kidnappers through the camera. Like if you have Madeline, please return her to me. You know, she's my little girl. We'll pay you. We won't report you. Just return her, please. We can also expect them to address the child through the camera because as far as they know, their kid might still be out there and they are on TV right now. This is their one opportunity to speak to their kid. So while a hoaxer might say, I'm, I'm wondering what, what's happening to my kid. I hope they're okay. Someone who actually doesn't know what happened, what happened to their kid will take the opportunity to speak to their kid through the TV because they don't know if they're watching or not. Finally, we can expect the parent to ask the community to help, and we can expect them to have some sort of call to action. Like if you see Madeline, call 911, or call this special hotline, or go to the special website after calling 911. The other thing to look for briefly is my hoax checklist. So hoaxers, when people who are making up a story are pushing a narrative in these interviews, they do certain things that indicate that they are hoaxing. For example, they're conclusive about what happened. We've seen that in the John Bonet case, Madeline McCann case, William Turrell case, Summer Wells case. They are vague about the money shot. And in the case of missing child, the money shot is the point in time where the kid went missing. They're very vague about the timeline and the details, usually because that's the part of the story they made up. So they're vague about it. They are reticent about the money shot. So if they get asked a lot of questions about it, they answer in very short answers. In other words, they're not trying to communicate information. They're trying to withhold information. And we see a difference between their displayed emotions and their reported emotions. So just because a mother is crying on camera and sobbing and weeping doesn't mean she's actually sad. 
if she doesn't tell us she was sad. So often you'll see with hoaxers that they'll be crying a lot, but they never actually report how worried they were or how they shouted and screamed for their kid or did anything that would indicate that they were actually scared the time the kid went missing or that they're actually experiencing the emotions they're displaying because acting is a lot easier than writing a script. All right. All that said, we're going to bear all that in mind. These two checklists as we watch Jennifer Soto, because she is appearing on the news. Okay. So the first question is if I can have your first, your last name and spell them both out for me. Okay. Jennifer Soto, J E N N I F E R S O T O. Mother. Mother. Jennifer, tell me how you feel right now. I feel like I can't breathe. All right. This, the reporter did a good job asking a vague question. Tell me how you feel right now. Because Jennifer is answering a vague question, we should pay attention to everything she says very closely because she's telling us what's on her mind when she thinks about her missing daughter. Remember, at this point, nobody knew what happened to Madeline. The body had not been recovered. Stephen Stearns had not been arrested. The first thing Jennifer says is, I feel like I can't breathe. So when she's prompted to speak about her daughter, she talks about not being able to breathe. She seems to be breathing just fine. In fact, she seems to be shaking and hyperventilating. So she's actually breathing a little bit too well. Why talk about not breathing? I'm sure that when the autopsy report is revealed, that they killed Madeline either by strangling her or suffocating her or covering her mouth and her nose to pass her out and then doing something else to her. In other words, when she thinks about Madeline, she thinks about breathing, probably because she's recalling something about restricting Madeline's airway. Could I be totally off? Of course, right? Leakage is cumulative. This is the first instance we've seen of her talking about breathing. I'm just noting it. If she brings it up again and again, then we can put some more chips on the cause of death. Let's keep listening. All I keep thinking about is, where is she? Is she safe? Is she okay? But we're, we're all a wreck. My entire family is a mess. My entire family is a mess. I believe her. When people are under stress, that's when you can expect them to leak the truth. Which is why in my deception deck, when I, in my card about, um, listening statements from uncooperative witnesses, I give four ways to increase their cognitive load, one of which is to have them repeat the events in reverse. All right, so the more stress you can put on somebody, the more likely they're going to leak true information. She's clearly stressed here, or at least she's doing a good job of acting like someone who's stressed and nervous by shaking and telling us that she feels that way. So when she says her family is a mess, I believe her. And as we've seen in the recent developments in the investigation, the family was, in fact, a mess. There seems to have been abuse, um, pedophilia, um, and even violence leading up to murder, right? So a gradual escalation of depravity. We're just so worried. When did you first realize, or when did you follow this report? We filed a missing report. Uh, It's also interesting that she says, we are just so worried. Just is a minimizing word. So when she says we are just so worried, it indicates to us that she's probably feeling a lot more than that. A lot more than just worry. Maybe she's nervous that she might get caught. Right. So instead of the worry about her daughter being missing, She might be downplaying the emotions she feels about getting caught for murdering her daughter or helping plan the murder of her daughter or being an accessory to the murder of her daughter. At this point, we don't know what her involvement is. This is my first time watching this interview. However, it is the trending topic in the DD forum. So I have read some of the analysis done by members 
of the channel like Jet Fuel Jenny, Sophia Brayland. Um, lots of them done very deep dives in this, and I've read parts of their comments. So while this is my first time watching this myself, I have a good feel for this case already from what I've seen in the forum. We called the police at like 4.45 uh, yesterday, uh, 4.45 p.m., but she actually went missing early that morning around between 8.45 and 9 o'clock in the morning she went missing. All right, so this is interesting as well. She says, we reported her missing, but she went missing. If you drop your kid off here, she's going to say that they dropped her daughter off at school or something like that, and the daughter wanted to walk to the school, so they dropped her off around the corner or something. That's like their story. If you drop your kid off for them to walk a block down to school, you don't know when they went missing. So the fact that she's staying conclusively, she went missing at this particular time, instead of saying something like, the last time I saw her was at this time, is a slight indication that she's being conclusive, that she might be pushing a narrative. And as you'll recall from my intro, conclusiveness is one of the checks, uh, one of the signs of a hoax. So telling us when she went missing is a red flag. Telling us the last time she saw Madeline would be the correct way to phrase this. Um, we had dropped her off close to the school. Um, she wanted to walk the rest of the way. Sorry. She wanted to walk the rest of the way. What is that? It's a slight victim blaming. Think about if this mother dropped her daughter off a block from school and her daughter was kidnapped in that short walk. She would be kicking herself. I let her walk. I shouldn't have done that. I should have taken her straight up to the door of the school and watched her walk in. Not blaming the daughter. Well, she wanted to walk there and look what happened. When your kid goes missing, your kid can do no wrong. You miss them. You feel bad. You're kicking yourself as a parent for letting anything happen to them. We saw a similar thing in the Summer Wells case, which I've also done a series on, where the parents say, well, Summer liked to play outside and that was her downfall. That's victim blaming. The actual parent of a missing child kicks themselves. Why did I let her play outside unsupervised? Why didn't I make sure I was watching her? I knew she liked to play outside. I didn't put up a camera. I didn't put up a ring doorbell. I, I didn't make sure that she had a dog with her or that grandma was watching her. These are the comments of actual innocent parents, like the mother of Michael Monkey Vaughn, who I've uh, done a little bit of analysis on in other videos. Also, if you're watching this video, you'll notice that Jennifer Soto is smirking and smiling because I, I think like a parrot or a toy is making noise in the background. That is bizarre. I will admit also that her shaking nervously is bizarre. I've seen Pat Brown comment about the nervous shaking and saying it's the first time she's ever seen it. If you, if you know my channel, you followed me for a while. I don't analyze body language. I try to ignore it. I'm just pointing it out so you know I also see it. I'm not factoring it into my analysis. I don't think this is, for example, duper's delight. People do bizarre things when they're actually distressed. So the shaking, uh, the mother of a missing child who feels bad about being negligent and letting her daughter get kidnapped while dropping off at school could be sh shaking just as nervously as the mother who helped plan the murder of her daughter and is scared of getting caught. Right. So we can't read too much into the body language and it can be dangerous and misleading to do so. It's much better to focus on the words because people pick their words out of a dictionary of around 30,000 words for the average, average English speaker. So where there's, as there's only a certain number of movements I can do with my hands and my eyes, I have tens of thousands of words to choose from, which is why the ones that people pick are much more telling than where their eyes are looking or you know, whether or not they're shuffling their feet.
we dropped her off at school, close to school. Um, she wanted to walk the rest of the way. Actually, I'm glad we have that interruption. So one of the things I always point out in my videos where I believe the parents are responsible for what happened to their kid is I point out scripting where it looks like the parents sat down ahead of time and came up with their story so that they could recite it to the police, to the news, and stay on the same page. It typically happens with co-conspirators, like the McCanns, in my opinion, are Candace and Don Wells, or John and Patsy Ramsey. When there's two people, the chances of their story getting um, exposed as a lie goes up by a factor of a thousand, right? It's much easier if you can lie alone, you say you're the only person there. And then the only way to screw up is if you contradict yourself in future interviews. When there's two people involved now, now you have to co corroborate your story with each other in the present across interviews over time between each other. So typically what criminals do when there's two or more of them is they craft their story, they script it out ahead of time so they can recite it perfectly. And one of the indicators of a scripted story is that they recount it verbatim every time they tell it. And you can see this with Kate McCann when she talks about going into the room to find Madeline. Across years, her story has remained virtually unchanged word for word. So let's listen here. Let's see if Jennifer Soto, before that interruption, said exactly what she just said now, right? Because if they did do something to their daughter and the story of dropping her off is a cooked up alibi, which we know it is now, we can expect them to have scripted that story beforehand and she should tell it the exact same way both times before the interruption by the parrot or the toy and after. All right, so here's the first time she says it. We had dropped her off close to the school. Um, she wanted to walk the rest of the way. Sorry. All right, we had dropped her off close to the school. She wanted to walk the rest of the way. First of all, Notice how vague that is. If the last time you saw your daughter was two blocks from the school near a park bench or three blocks away near a bus stop, you would be telling us that. Because any little detail could lead to catching the person who took your daughter. So, like any scripted story, it's vague so that they're not pinned down to details. So that if, they, if the police say, you know, there's actually a camera near that bus stop, they're not pinned down to that. And they can say, well, then we dropped her a block closer. So scripted stories are typically vague. All right. So let's see if the second time she says it, after this little interruption, it's exactly the same as the first time. We dropped her off close to the school. She wanted to walk the rest of the way. We dropped her off at school, close to school. Um, she wanted to walk, walk the rest of the way. Wow. Word for word. In fact, she said we dropped her off at school and then corrected herself to say close to school. That's a great indication that this story is scripted. <clears throat> I have not seen later... Stephen Stearns gives an interview. I wonder if he will say the exact same thing. And if he does, we can stack up a lot of chips on our bet that this story is scripted. And if it is scripted, that tells us that she helped plan the murder or at least helped cover it up and was basically on board with the cover up at the very least on board with what they would tell police and the news about it. And it's very telling that she said we dropped her off at school and then went back to correct herself to say close to school. Word for word. Um, I 
I'm not sure what I'm allowed to share. You can uh, share whatever you feel comfortable sharing. I know you had conversations with detectives. So that might be all they scripted, right? So you're going to say, so what we're going to say is we dropped her off close to the school. She wanted to walk the rest of the way. It's not our fault. We didn't do anything wrong. And we're just going to leave it at that. And that's why after she gives her little word for word spiel, she says she's not sure what to say next. If your daughter is missing, you say anything you can. And we have great examples of this. If you've seen my video, what do innocent parents sound like? Where we looked at uh, the biological mother of Gannon Stouch, who was kidnapped and murdered by his stepmother. She did not ask the police, what can I say? Can I say this or that? She said anything she needed to say. Anything that might help her find her son. Same with Michael Monkey Vaughn. We looked, I looked at her uh, interview with the interview room briefly in my last Summer Wells video at the end. And she admits even embarrassing things about her home life in order to help find her son, to put any information she can out there. So the fact that Jennifer seems like she's giving a scripted story of what happened that day and is now being reticent, reticent regarding the money shot, which is another one of the four things on my hoaxer checklist, is not a good sign. Um, not sure what that conversation <clears throat> is, but whichever you feel comfortable sharing that we'll put the awareness out there. Yeah, she was uh, spotted walking uh, by the church, by the middle school uh, on the cameras. They saw her hang out in the parking lot for a little bit and then get up and leave. They didn't see a vehicle or anything else. They just saw her walk away uh, around 9 a.m. heading towards the school, but she never made it. Um, yeah. What has the school said? Have you given any contact with the school? Yes. Um, that they're doing everything they can. They've given me all their resources. The principal has called me. They've looked at their cameras. Cameras, um, I don't think they've caught anything on the cameras. It's too far away from the sidewalk. Everything is too grainy, so they can't see specific faces. Um, but they've looked. Um, I'm just waiting to hear anything else from them. Is this normal? So one thing you'll notice here is the reticence where everything she says has to be prompted by the interviewer. Whereas actual parents of missing children, you can expect them to be, to at least address a kidnapper, address the child, ask for help, provide a call to action. All of these things do not have to be prompted. The parents just do them because that's the entire point of the interview. When the parent of a missing child goes onto TV or onto a talk show or speaks to the press and it feels like you're pulling teeth trying to get information from them, you need to ask yourself, why are they being so reticent? It doesn't always mean they're guilty. Right? It doesn't mean that they killed their kid. They might be re being reticent because they were stoned at the time their kid was actually kidnapped and they're embarrassed about it. Or they're negligent. And they don't want to admit that they were, you know, passed out drunk or that they let a child abuser live with them. So they're being reticent because they know more than they want to say. And they're ashamed of their contribution to the kidnapping, even if they didn't help plan it or even if it was a legitimate kidnapping. However, if your kid is kidnapped, that should be your top priority rather than shame or embarrassment or being scared of getting um, brought up on other charges like possession um, or, you know, or admitting that you were using drugs at the time your kid was actually kidnapped. So you'll notice here that everything she says has to be prompted so far by the interviewer and she has not done any of the four things, um, four of the seven things on my list of what we expect from the actual innocent parent of a missing child to do in a presser or interview. So let's keep listening. Normal behavior? Not at all. To just not show up or call or text or anything? Not at all, no. Um, she, 
from time to time she will leave her cell phone at home accidentally and that's actually what happened yesterday she left her phone at home she went to all right so from time to time she will leave her cell phone at home do i believe that maybe it's true i don't know any 13 year old girl who doesn't go everywhere with their cell phone and then we have the word actually. She says that's actually what happened that day. The word actually is a comparison word. It means you're comparing one thing with another. For example, if someone says, hey, DD, what do you prefer, hot dogs or hamburgers? And I say, well, I prefer hamburgers. You know, actually, I prefer hot dogs because um, – you know, last time I ate a hamburger, I got a stomach ache from the cheese and hot dogs don't have cheese. So actually I prefer hot dogs. I'm comparing two things. That's just why, which is why I use the word actually. Jennifer here, when she says actually, isn't being asked a binary question or to compare two things. She's speaking freely about the cell phone. She brought up the cell phone. So why is she saying actually? actually can be an indicator of deception because it means they're, someone's comparing two things in their head. They're comparing their memory with their imagination. They're comparing the truth with their script. And so they end up saying, actually, when in any other situation, it does not make sense. If she actually forgot her phone there, we can expect Jennifer to just say she left her phone at home. We could also expect her to say as the mother, and I'm kicking myself for not making sure she didn't take her phone. Because if she had her phone, I'd know where she is. We don't see any regret about her involvement, but we do see a ton of victim blaming. She wanted to walk to school, which gave the kidnapper an opportunity to take her. She stupidly forgot her phone. Her fault. If she remembered her phone, she wouldn't have been kidnapped. So we have lots of subtle victim blaming, which is not a good sign at all. Went to school. Um, but that happens from time to time. She's got ADHD, uh, her memory. <laughs> More victim blaming. Right? She's got ADHD. If she could focus better, maybe she could have walked straight to the school door without getting kidnapped. And then she talks about um, her memory. Maybe she just remembered the path to school. She wouldn't have been kidnapped. These are not the things I expect the parent of a missing child to say. These are things I expect someone who was involved in the kid's murder or death or abuse to say. Because if you allow your daughter to get abused by your boyfriend and then murdered by your boyfriend, you need to do a lot of mental gymnastics to degrade your daughter in your own mind to allow that to happen. And I think that's what's coming out here. We've only seen three minutes and 40 seconds of, of an interview. This woman's daughter is allegedly out there missing. We haven't seen her describe her daughter. We haven't seen her say one positive thing about her daughter. We haven't seen her blame herself at all for allowing her 13-year-old minor daughter to be kidnapped. Or any curiosity about the boyfriend involved in all this or who might have taken her. So as far as I'm concerned, this is a great textbook case of, of someone who has guilty knowledge. She's hitting all the check marks on my hoax checklist. And the beauty of these checklists is these are um, old checklists I've had for a long time. I've featured them in other videos, but just look how predictive they are. We've applied these to multiple cases and come to the same conclusion when we see someone check all these boxes. And when parents don't check these boxes, I'm sa I can safely say I think the parent is innocent, like Michael Monkey Vaughn. This is another old checklist. We've applied it to multiple cases, and it's just as predictive. So do I think Jennifer Soto knows more than she's saying? Definitely. The next step is to determine, did she help plan the cover-up or did she help plan the murder or did she participate in the murder? She's very forgetful. Um, so, yeah, there's no way to track her right now because I have 
Well, the detective does not have her phone. Uh, but this isn't normal behavior now. What was the last thing, I guess, that the conversation that you two had, you and your daughter? Um, we spoke about her birthday party. She had a birthday party on Sunday. Uh, she had a great time. Uh, I couldn't make it because I was working. But she had an amazing time. She was so happy with all her gifts. Uh, I, I told her good night and um, yeah, that was it. I, I, I was the one who took her to school in the morning. That was my partner. Um, but yeah. So she's saying her boyfriend took Madeline to school in the morning, but she has zero curiosity about what he might have done to her. If your kid goes missing, everybody's a suspect. I've said this in the McCann case. I said this in the Wells case. In all, both of those cases, the parents were separated. They weren't in the same place at the same time. If your kid goes missing, the other parent, like it or not, is a suspect especially if this is not the biological father. This is just some boyfriend of hers. She has zero suspicion that he did anything to her at this point. If you're a mother panicking about your missing kid, everybody's a suspect, including the boyfriend. We don't see any curiosity about him. Why? Probably because she knows exactly what happened to her daughter. Also notice their last conversation was vague and Earlier, she said, we dropped her off at school. Now she's saying he dropped her off at school. Pronouns are one of the most instinctive things in the English language. When someone gets the pronoun wrong, you need to flag that as a giant red flag. When someone says we instead of I or I instead of he or she, whenever someone gets a pronoun wrong or flip-flops, you need to consider the possibility that the story is made up. That they're getting them confused because they don't have the, the firmness of a memory in their head about what happened. They have the more malleable imagination story of what happened. And people can make mistakes that way. So already she just made a pronoun mistake, which is a giant red flag. Thirteen. Also, the other thing, when she was just talking right now, one of the reasons I came back to YouTube was the Ruby Frankie story where uh, a mother was publicly abusing her kids on YouTube. And I came back because it, it uh, infuriated me so much that people weren't catching on. And I want people like that to be scared. I want them to be afraid that someone like me will come along and catch them. And I will use their words against them. And I wish my channel were larger so that Jennifer Soto and Steven Stearns would have been too scared to do this because they knew someone like me or one of the members or subscribers of my channel or four members who have a bunch of great comments about this case would be on to them would post their case in the forum, and we would expose them. It Unfortunately, it's too late for Madeline Soto. They weren't scared of getting caught. Right? They cooked up their little story, their little script. We dropped her off close to school, and she wanted to walk. They thought that little story would would be enough. And for Jennifer, it might be enough, but I doubt it. The police in this case seem to be on top of things. And I've put all my chips that she will go down next. Thirteen. But hopefully the next mother that considers doing this will think of us when they think that they're going to do something to their daughter or their son or their kid and get away with it. She's 13 years old. Yes. 13. Madeline. 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 Um... What are you thinking right now? In my heart, I feel like somebody took her. This isn't like her. 
Okay. And now we have the conclusiveness. Somebody took her. That's what the McCann said. That's what the Wells said. That's what the Ramsey said. That's what William Turrell's parents said down in Australia. If your kid is actually missing, that might be one possibility. But it's not the only possibility. So when we analyze interviews or pressers with parents of actual missing children, of actual innocent parents, they say they might be kidnapped. Maybe he wandered off. They put out all the possibilities because they want people looking. He might have wandered off. He loved going down to the creek or here. She loved um, wandering around. Maybe she got distracted by something because of her ADHD and, and she went into the park near the school. People need to check that park. There's nothing like that here. It's just conclusive. Well, in my heart of hearts, I think she was kidnapped. To just pick up and run away um, or just not go to school. Um, I don't know what to think. Friends, the friend's parent. See, I don't know what to think. Reticence again. It's like pulling teeth. If you look at the actual parents of missing children, they will rattle off possibilities until the interviewer reins them back in because they're curious about what happened to their kid. You know, maybe she wandered off. How can Jennifer say, well, I don't think she ran off or I don't think she just didn't go to school. It's a possibility, isn't it? Your kid is missing. Maybe she left the phone at home so she could run away. But there's no curiosity like that. There's, there's no consideration of other possibilities. They pick one possibility, one narrative they're going to push, which in all the cases we've analyzed on the channel of, of guilty parents, is a kidnapping. Because it directs the attention away from them. Rather than looking at the parents, people are out looking for a, a mysterious stranger kidnapper. So this really is textbook. This is right there with the McCanns, the Wells, the Ramseys, and uh, the Tyrrells, or foster parents. Parents, you've contacted and everyone. went through every single person? Everyone that we know that she knows. We've contacted them all, reached out to them. The parents have gone out to search and look for her as well. And we haven't come up with anything yet. I've seen a lot of posts on uh, Facebook, um, Hunter's Creek, rants and raves and what have you did people um say that they were going to conduct some type of like search party or anything uh, a lot of people have asked me to volunteer like if, if there is one if, the, if they can do one um there i have people passing out flyers going to every store in that vicinity a gas station church um i think people people are being People are asking her if they can search. Not her asking people if, if they can search for her. She's been given a golden opportunity here to ask for help. She hasn't done it. She's been given a perfect opportunity for a call to action. You know, if you see her, here's what she looks like. We don't have a single description of her. She hasn't even said Madeline's name which is extreme distancing language. We're being stopped in the street this morning in front of the school to see if they've seen anything, if they've heard anything. My family is, they're going all out right now. Um, yeah. I know as a mother, you have, a lot is going on in your brain. Um, so much. To bring her back home. What have, what have the, the law enforcement told you that you are able to share? I mean, that they're doing the best they can. Uh, they've had detectives come out, interview us. They took a piece of her clothing for the canine dog to see if they can sniff her out. I'm not sure when that's being done. Um, do you have any inkling where she possibly could be? Like if you would say, okay, last time, um, 
It's also interesting that she said to sniff her out. Not that they took a piece of clothing to track her down or to lead them to her, to sniff her out. She might be picturing uh, Madeline's body in the dumpster, right? Or her book bag in the dumpster that Stephen put her in. And so she says, sniff her out, out of something, right? Like she's inside a container. That could be a little bit of leakage that she literally knows where the body is. I went to work and came back. She was at James' house or, or, or Sabrina's house. Um, maybe I forgot to check that house or she played at this. Even the interviewer here is realizing just how reticent Jennifer is. Notice how he has to prompt her, like pulling teeth to talk about potential places that Madeline might be. So already we have her hitting all four signs of a hoax. Conclusiveness, vagueness about the money shot, reticence about the money shot, and displayed versus reported emotions. She's shaking nervously and, and opening her eyes wide and, and pouting. But she hasn't told us that she is depressed or she, that she went outside and shouted and drove up and down the street shouting for her daughter, shouting Madeline's name. Right? She hasn't reported any um, reflections of her nervousness. She's just displaying this bizarre nervousness, which I admit is bizarre. And then as far as the press or interview goes, we've had a golden opportunity for a call to action. She hasn't done it. She hasn't asked for help. She hasn't addressed Madeline. She hasn't addressed. She said she thinks Madeline was kidnapped. She hasn't addressed a kidnapper. She is conclusive. Well, fairly conclusive that Madeline was kidnapped. She hasn't posited any other theories, but she was able to shut down that Madeline didn't go to school or didn't run away based on what evidence. I don't know how she was able to uh, um, rule those out. Is she being cooperative? She's answering every question, but she's not answering them fully and she's not being candid. She's not providing full, complete answers, which is what the interviewer is getting at right now. And I think so far she has referred to Madeline in present tense. So at least she's done that correctly. This part one weekend, maybe she went back there or something like that. We've looked everywhere we could have thought and anywhere she would have been. Um, she would have known to wait for me at the school, um, but we did check where if she could have walked. Um, my mom's office is close to the school. We checked there. We checked the walking paths that she could have taken. We've checked all of her friend's house. And I think we've checked everywhere I could think of, honestly. All of her friend's house? Does she only have one friend? I'm sure they checked one house, if that, which is why she can't bring herself to say houses. In other words, it sounds like she's talking talking to CPS. She sounds like an abusive parent who's being questioned by Child Protective Services and is trying to give answers without revealing too much and trying to look like a good mother. But the Overton window has shifted so far with her she has degraded her daughter so far in her mind that she doesn't realize that all she's done is blame her daughter and belittle her. Even in a public interview that she's, she knows is being shown all over the news, she cannot help but belittle her daughter. Right? She has ADHD. She's forgetful. She forgot her phone. She wanted to walk to school. She got kidnapped. It's her fault, not me. She's 13 years old. She's old enough. She should know not to get kidnapped, which is sick. These people should be afraid. It's why I came back to YouTube. I want them to be afraid. What do you think? Um, oh, gosh, I just had it tip my tongue. What was she wearing? She was last seen wearing a green hoodie. She was last seen wearing. Seen by who? 
This is a weird distancing way to say, to respond to a question. Why is she saying it this way? Why didn't she say uh, she was wearing a green hoodie? Or when I dropped her off, she was wearing her green hoodie and underneath it, she had a blue shirt. Why she was last seen wearing? Because this is probably fabricated. Or actually, we know why she did this. In order to conceal the fact that the last person to see her was the boyfriend, not her. Right? She's still trying to semi paint the picture that she was there in the morning and she might have been part involved in dropping her off at school when she said we dropped her off. So she's trying to conceal the identity of the last person to see her because she's not the last person to see her. Black shorts, white Crocs, a black Jan Sport backpack with gray hibiscus flowers on it. I used it. This is not like her. Not at all. To run away, an argument, anything like that to provoke her. She's never done anything like this, no. And we haven't had any arguments recently to have this outcome. Any arguments recently? So that means they do have arguments. It is also revealing that they do have arguments that are bad enough that Madeline has run away in the past or has threatened to, right? So they have had arguments that are bad enough that Madeline could have run away based on one of those arguments. Because earlier it was Jennifer who brought up the notion that Madeline might have run away. What school? Hunter's Creek Middle School. Tom, any questions? No. Yeah. Is there anything that you think our viewers would need to know about the way you're feeling, the way the family's feeling, Madeline? All right. Here is the opportunity to address Madeline, address the kidnapper, ask for help, describe Madeline, put out the local phone number to the police if you spot her, to describe her, to say her name, right? She hasn't even said Madeline, I don't think yet, still. Her name's Madeline. If you see her, she looks like this. She responds to Madeline, Maddie. We are desperate for any answers, anything that you could do to help. I'm here for it. Just please, if, if you see my daughter, just please bring her home. I just hope you're okay, Maddie. I hope you're safe. I hope you're not hurt. I just hope she's okay. Okay, so she finally addresses Madeline through the screen. She doesn't describe her. She doesn't say, she doesn't describe her. So help her or whatever, any information. What are people looking for? When, um, when did you notice that she was missing because this was at the beginning of the, the morning. Um, she got dropped off in the morning. We did not notice until after school. Right, she got dropped off. So more passive language. She was last seen wearing a green hoodie. She got dropped off. Why do people use passive language in order to conceal identities? Right, she wants us to think that she was there when Madeline was dropped off. Or in fact, she wants us to think that Madeline was actually dropped off. But she can't bring herself to say it because she knows it's a lie. Madeline was never dropped off at school. So she puts it in the passive. The passive is another great indicator of deception. And in fact, it's such a good indicator that it is in the deception deck. The deception deck is my 52 favorite rules for spotting lies and manipulation. And as I said, the passive voice is one of the cards in the deck, and I'll just quickly read you that rule. Liars frequently use passive voice to minimize their responsibility. If the subject is missing from a sentence, 
particularly in cases where this omission results in grammatical awkwardness, it may indicate that the speaker is attempting to evade responsibility. In this case, Jennifer is saying, uh, talking about dropped off or last seen in the passive voice because she doesn't want to take responsibility for being the last person to see Madeline because she isn't or dropping Madeline off because she's not the one who did it. In fact, Madeline was never dropped off. So she puts it in the passive. So you should always be alert to the passive voice. To pick up at four, at four o'clock when I went to go pick her up and she wasn't at school. So we're going in 24 hours now? Yeah. Just about? Yeah. Nothing? Nothing. No word, no text message, no messages anywhere from her. I've looked at all her social medias. I've looked at all her games she could have played with, any, any app, no weird conversations, no, nothing strange. Everything was conversations with just normal friends or us. Did she knows how to get home by herself? As if like, let's just say, take a, to take a bus or an Uber or something like that. She would know how to get home alone, correct? I'm not sure. I don't know if she would know how to get home. Maybe, I mean, if someone, I'm thinking if someone got in the car with her and, and if she pointed the way, what roads, she probably could figure out how to get, but like, does she know a full address? I don't think, she, I don't think she does. Which would give me the, which, I mean, it just puts in my brain that she always comes home with with someone. She always comes so home with me. there's no need for her to really exactly. learn. Okay. And you said no time? He knows everything. Oh. Right, we're coming up on an hour, so I'll wrap it up here. If you want me to continue looking into this case, let's get this video to 50,000 views. Please like, share, comment for the algo. On your screen right now is a video I recommend you watch next, as well as my playlist about Casey Anthony, a case that is very reminiscent of this one. Until next time, stay true.